Okay. Um, hello, everyone. It is my great pleasure to welcome all of you to the webinar, Multi-Hazard Approach and COVID-19, Flattening the Curve and Early Recovery Lessons. This is organized by the APLU Multi-Hazards Program and International Research Institute of Disaster Science, Irides Tohoku University in Japan. I'm Takako Izumi, Associate Professor of Tohoku University and Program Director of the APRU multi Hazards Program. Thank you very much again for joining us today. Um, I believe that COVID-19 pandemic made various impacts on our uh, work and life to some extent. In Tohoku University, we are still providing the uh, online classes and encouraged working uh, from home. I hope we can start a regular classroom uh, a lecture from second semester uh, in September. I'd like to introduce very briefly about the Association of Pacific Lem Universities. APLU is a network uh, that consists of 55 universities in the Pacific Lem from uh, 18 economies. And its international secretariat is uh, based in Hong Kong. You can receive more uh, information on APLU and the programs and events from its uh, website. Under APLU, there are several programs such as Global Health and uh, Sustainable City and Landscape, and Multi Hazard Program is one of them. The Multi Hazard Program was established in 2013, um, then its secretariat is hosted by Tohoku University in Japan. The program has been working to strengthen the collaborative researches on disaster science and contribute to international and regional discussions for policy making, disaster risk reduction policy making. And one of the major activities is that uh, Marty Hazard Summer School to be hosted at Tohoku University every year. This year, we plan to have a virtual summer school in July, and I would like to give more information on that at the end of uh, this seminar. In addition to that, we organize the annual symposium in uh, one of the member universities every year. The last one will be the uh, campus safety workshop, campus safety program that organize a workshop every two years to discuss the uh, uh, preparedness capacity and uh, on campus. So this webinar invites a wonderful speakers from different sectors, such as UN agency, government, and private sector and academia. So they will share with us today their experience and response to uh, response to and recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. So while you are listening to the presentations, I'd like to encourage you to send us questions using the Q&A uh, function on this uh, Zoom. Then after all the presentation, we will have a Q&A session and discussion with all the uh, speakers and the panelists. So please send us a Q&A. And uh, sorry, please send us the questions. Also, we would like to ask you to share this webinar information and tag at APLD1997 and hashtag APLD plus on Facebook and Twitter. So now I'd like to introduce and welcome the first speaker, uh, Dr. Chris Watremiman. He is the Secretary General of APLU for his opening remarks. So thank you, Chris, uh, for joining us today. Over to you. Uh, thank you, Takako, and thank you for this wonderful initiative. Let me share my screen with people so that I can give a few introductory remarks. Um, Okay, is that screen now shared? Yes, okay. And I just need now to play this, okay. So um, welcome to all participants uh, to this very important webinar. And also my thanks uh, to the speakers and to the moderator, Dr. Shaw. Uh, I want just to let you know a little bit about APRU uh, before we begin. And that just to let you know that we see ourselves as bringing together um, thought leaders and researchers and policy makers on the big issues of, of the region and of the day. And uh, to bring together 
different sectors, uh, not only academia, but policy makers and business and community organizations and NGOs. So we see that as our role and uh, we have quite a range of 55 research intensive universities around the Asia Pacific region. And of course, one of our major features is the Pacific Ring, Ring of Fire, which we all share. And in, res, in regard to the big issues that we work on, uh, they range from multi-hazards through global health, sustainable cities and landscapes, uh, the leadership of women in the Asia Pacific and sustainable waste management, to name a few. And we engage quite intensively uh, with um, the UN agencies and APEC and, uh, and others. So that's our role. Um, we have also uh, introduced in response to the cri current crisis, uh, a number of initiatives which remind us and uh, of the tremendous, not only the, the uh, difficulties of this crisis, but the opportunities for collaboration in these uncertain times, the opportunity to, to lead, to create, to inspire and to learn from each other. So uh, we're already sharing policies and actions together uh, and we have a web page, Coronavirus Emergencies and APIU Universities, which uh, lists many of the actions our members are taking. And that is a service not only to our members, but to others who are interested. Uh, we have a website also on apiuplus.org, which features webinars such as this. And, uh, and many activities under each of these um, headings that you see there at the moment, multi-hazards, global health, higher education, and some student competitions and ways of sharing resources. So um, we encourage all of you who are on this webinar to, to look at these others and to you're most welcome to um, join in with any of these initiatives. Um, Today's webinar is part of this overall series developed in cooperation with the APIU Multi Hazards Program at Tohoku University and hosted by uh, Dr. Izumi uh, on behalf of the International Research Institute of Disaster Science. So we're most grateful, as I said, for that. And you'll see there, uh, if you go into each of those on, our, on the APIUplus.org website, you'll see many other activities. So it's my pleasure to welcome you to, to this webinar and invite you to stay connected with us through the uh, addresses and uh, links you see on the screen. So I wish you all a very profitable uh, and worthwhile webinar. And again, my thanks to you all for participating. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Chris, for your introduction and the welcome remarks. So next I'd like to introduce a uh, today's Today's moderator of, uh, for this session to this webinar, uh, Professor Rajiv Sho from Graduate School of Media and Co Governance of Keio University in Japan. I'm sure most of you know him already from uh, his tremendous experience in DR and climate change and, and various researches and field activities. So we are very honored to have you today because he's an extremely busy person. So Professor Sho, thank you for joining us today. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Takako-san, for the kind introduction and a very good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you. There are uh, 206 um, participants as of now, 207 now. Uh, so I assume that it is from different parts of the world uh, and uh, thank you very much for joining. Uh, as you know that year uh, 2020 it has uh, it's a very significant year for many reasons uh, this year uh, disaster risk reduction has become what I say 30 year old and 30 year means it has become a mature adult disaster risk reduction as a subject the reason that in 1990 we started the first international decade for disaster risk reduction what is called IDNDR and then from 2000, there was the global uh, international strategy for disaster reduction, what was the UN ISDR. 
And then recently the name has been changed to UNDRR. Those who work on the disaster field, all of you know that from 2005 to 2015, first 10 years, we had the Hyogo Framework Collection, Global Framework for Disasters, which was followed by the Sendai uh, Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction, popularly known as SFDRR or Sendai Framework, and which was from 2015. So 2020 uh, is supposed to be a super year when we have five years from the Sustainable Development Goal, the Sendai Framework, and Paris Agreement. And all of these three global frameworks were adopted in 2015. So um, to commemorate, I will, uh, I'm not sure whether I should use the word commemorate, to address the fears of achievement of these three major frameworks, there were many monitoring and reporting system in place, and there were national monitoring, there were regional monitoring, and so on. But we have seen that what we faced in last uh, several months for this pandemic in different parts of the world. It is almost six months in some countries, three to four months in some countries after the first case was reported. For some of the countries, we say that the first peak is over and what we call the initial flattening of the curve. For some countries, it is still the middle of the peak, the first peak. And for some countries, it is told that the first peak is yet to arrive. So possibly COVID-19 is one of the longest, what we call the live disaster. And there are many estimates we don't know which one is right or wrong, that this particular disaster may last for 18 to sometimes maybe 24 months from the inception of this disaster. So fighting uh, COVID-19, uh, while we are fighting COVID-19, possibly we also need some strategy or approach to live, a, live with COVID-19. As we say that the living with risk and with many different uncertainties in the field. If you see our today's title of this particular seminar, Multi-Hazard Approach and COVID-19, Flattening the Curve and Early Recovery Lessons. When we have such a very long life disaster, there are many different other seasonal disasters which come in between. We have already experienced uh, some major typhoons or cyclones in some parts of Asia and Pacific. Some parts of the region has also experienced the heat waves. East Asia, where I am located, where Takako-san is located, where my colleague uh, from South Korea, Dr. Kim, is located, and also uh, our secretariat is located. We are possibly entering into the rainy season and followed by in between the typhoon season. So, it's not only just so-called the natural hazards. We have also seen during past three, four months, there are gas leakage, there are industrial disasters. So it's really a multi-hazard approach which is required uh, in between these long ranging life disasters. So in this long history, uh, or I will say in the long journey of living slash fighting, with COVID-19, we thought that we would first focus on some of the initial lessons from different perspectives of UN agencies, uh, governments, private sector, and academia, and to collectively uh, uh, try that how they are try to do uh, to cope with or fight with the disaster. We have four speakers here. Uh, we have four speakers here. Uh, we have uh, speakers from uh, UNDRR, we have speakers from national government, we have speakers from uh, our uh, private sector, and we have speakers from academia. So we will have 10 minutes presentation from each of the speakers. Uh, first, maybe we will uh, try to listen from Dr. Kim uh, who, is, uh, who is from the national government in Korea, Dr. Young Kyun Kim, 
who is the Director General of National Disaster and Safety Control Center of Ministry of Interior and Safety of South Korea. And Dr. Kim, let, let me introduce uh, him a little bit. Uh, many of you possibly know him. He's one of the leading figures in National Disaster and Safety Control Center under the Ministry, Ministry of Interior and Safety of Government of uh, Republic of Korea, what he call South Korea. And he has worked on resilience building, risk governance, climate change policies, public administration, technology policies, capacity development and emergency management in Korea, US, and also uh, he was seconded to UNDRR, United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction, over his very long 24 years of professional and academic careers. I know that being a government official and also being still within the disaster phase, I know how busy you are, Dr. Kim, and we highly appreciate your participation. So we uh, over to you, Dr. Kim, for your uh, comments and presentation. And you have 10 minutes for presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rajiv. Uh, it is a great pleasure for me to join this webinar to share Korea's experience in responding to and recovering from the COVID-19. And I just shared my presentation so everyone can see the, my uh, slide. Uh, my name is Yong Kyung Kim, working for the Korean government and is in the Ministry of Safety, uh, Interior and Safety. Uh, in this slide, Korea had to deal with the unexpected situations uh, just a month after the first the confirmed case was reported on January 20, uh, 2020. After the first 31st case was confirmed on February 19 in Daegu City, the number of new coronavirus cases rapidly increased peaking at 916 on February 29. But Korea drastically reduced the confirmed cases and flattened the curve within a month. Afterwards, the Korean government has been taking various proactive measures to keep a stabilizing trend and return the society on a path to normalcy. Today, I would like to share the three success factors that is crisis leadership, innovative technologies, and clear roles and responsibilities. First, the leadership of the president, prime minister, and the head of the Korea Center for Disease Control and Prevention, Korea CDC, have played critical roles in fighting COVID-19 in Korea. They show that identifying emerging issues making evidence-based decisions, unifying administrative efforts through the democratic processes are essential features for crisis leadership. President Moon Jae-in quickly and sharply understood the crisis situation and made proper decisions based on expert group's advice. He put the national priority on mobilizing all available resources to prevent the nationwide spread of COVID-19. And the Korean government kept the entire response process transparent to the public. This slide shows the mobile text message about the status and movement path of the confirmed cases distributed by the local government. Also, in the extraordinary virtual G20 summit held on March 27 of this year, President Moon emphasized that stronger global solidarity is essential in overcoming this novel global crisis. When confirmed patients rapidly increased in Daegu City in last February, Prime Minister Jung Se-kyun stayed in the region for three weeks and solved various problems in the field. 
He also chaired the daily video conferences with the participation of relevant ministers, city mayors, and provincial governors. The conference consisted of the situation reports, various feedback sessions from participants, and debates about the expected problems and solutions. This democratic process helped to reduce the gaps between measures prepared by the central government and implementation in the field. In addition, both the president and the prime minister gave complete authority to combat the spread of COVID-19 to Dr. Jung Eun Gyeong, head of the Korea CDC. With this empowerment, Dr. Jung was able to control all emergency situations effectively. And during daily briefings, she explained the current situation and government measures candidly and sincerely. Thanks to her efforts, citizen trust in the government response was built, which was a great part of Korea's success to fight COVID-19. Second, the Korea's successful response was centered on widespread testing, contact tracing, and rigorous treatment labeled the 3T strategy. This was made possible through technology innovation and extensive use of ICT tools along with an enhanced security protocol for data protection. The specific examples include RT-PCR test and drive-through methods. I'll give a specific examples in the next slide. The RT-PCR test kit made it possible for medical staff to get diagnostic test result within six hours. Also, the rapid approval system by the Korean authorities shortened the required approval time from one year to one month during an emergency situation. Another one is innovative drive-through testing method and work-through test booths. These two methods allowed people to conduct the whole testing process safely within a vehicle or within a safe booth. This one is the ICD-based quarantine information system. This system identified the persons coming from high-risk regions and monitor them during the incubation period of the infection. Another app is the, this slide shows the, another app about the self-quarantine safety protection application developed by the Ministry of Interior and Safety. This app was very useful to check on people who entered the country and were in self-quarantine. With this app, the tracking of the phone's GPS location of the self-quarantined person could be done with their consent. And a warning message will be sent to a dedicated official in the local government if the self-quarantined person leaves their designated residence without approval. Finally, I would like to mention the response manuals that clearly defined the roles and responsibilities of each responsible agency. Korea has enhanced this infectious disease response manual in the response to SARS in 2003, H1N1 in 2009 and MERS in 2015. For example, the roles of direct response agency like the Korean CDC and the coordinating agency like the Ministry of Interior and Safety were clearly delineated in the response manual. The Ministry of Interior and Safety took charge of monitoring and managing self quarantined people, operating temporarily the living facilities, and coordinating other central ministry support and local government countermeasures. Thanks to this support, the Korea CDC was able to serve as a command center to prevent and control infection. Before I finish, I'd like to highlight the three key points from the experience of COVID-19 pandemic for establishing future resilient society. One, the political leadership, which enabled the transparency and championed the democracy during the crisis situation. 
Two is uh, the extensive use of innovative technologies. And the last one is clearly delineated roles and responsibilities based on the response manuals. Uh, thank you for listening and come uh, Thank you, Dr. Thank you very much, Dr. Kim, for this wonderful summary. In this very short time, the way you have presented, I think, with these last three key points, uh, that really uh, summarizes the success story of the initial flattening of the curve for Korea. Political leadership, citizen uh, trust, technology, and clear role and responsibilities. I think those are very, very important points. So bringing that, uh, now let's go to a little bit on the regional perspective. Uh, we have with us uh, Ms. Loretta Heber Girardet. Uh, who is the Chief of uh, Regional Office for Asia and the Pacific, United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction, UNDRR. Many of you know her. Uh, she is a prominent figure in the field of disaster risk reduction in the region. Uh, Loretta, um, we call her Lori. Uh, she has a long career with the United Nations, uh, which spans more than 20 years, and during which she had worked in various positions related to humanitarian assistance, development cooperation, and very importantly, public health. So she brings that very interesting combination of humanitarian issues, development issues, public health, and disaster risk reduction. She was appointed as the chief of the regional office uh, uh, for Asia Pacific of the UNDRR based in Bangkok. Uh, Thailand in December 27. So thank you very much, Laurie. Once again, deep appreciation for joining us in spite of your many different important roles. Uh, so over to you, Laurie. And just um, one point to all the all the attendees that if you have any question to our uh, each speaker, please make sure that you use Q and A and ask the questions. And later, after all the four speakers presentation. Uh, we would like to have a Q&A session. Thank you very much and over to you, Lori. Thank you. Thank you, Rajiv. Uh, absolute pleasure to be here. Um, I'd like to start my presentation today, which I believe uh, should be shown on the screen very shortly. There we go. Uh, go to the first slide, please. Next slide. Great. So I'd like to start it by explaining a little bit about how the United Nations more generally has been working on the response uh, to COVID-19. I mean, it became very evident early on that this was a disaster unlike uh, any other that we've experienced in the recent past and that the impacts went far beyond the health sector. And in fact, the UN system really understood that COVID-19 had the potential to derail completely all of the work that had been going on in the region and indeed globally on achieving the sustainable development goals. And so it has developed a framework for socioeconomic response to COVID-19, really focusing in on those key elements that are so critical to ensure that countries remain on the pathway to sustainable development, even in the midst of this pandemic. And here it has highlighted the need for really uh, cooperation and technical support around social cohesion, gender equality, focusing on a green recovery, uh, debt relief, with an aim towards really rebooting a digital um, nature of how we are working in countries, as well as renewed multilateralism and hopefully social contracts. And without this effort, there is a sense that there will be a regression around SDGs. So in the region of Asia Pacific, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Thank you. We have organized ourselves around uh, what we now call issues-based coalitions. And these issue-based coalitions is a new way of working whereby the regions, uh, regional agencies give direct support to countries on these key issues. 
And each of these issues-based coalitions have developed a COVID-19 strategy to support countries. So looking at aspects of climate change mitigation, building resilience, inclusion and empowerment, which the UN has been prioritizing throughout the COVID pandemic, Mobility and urbanization, we know that migrants in particular have been hard hit uh, by the pandemic, uh, but also human rights and gender equality is two very critical aspects of the crisis. Next slide, please. So within this context, next slide, please. Within this context, UNDRR, is the co-chair of the Issues-Based Coalition on Building Resilience. And our strategy in the region has really been to support the overall UN strategy, which has three prongs, the preventing deaths and containing the spread of the pandemic, which is led by the health sector, but then also to protect the most vulnerable from socioeconomic impacts and to prepare to recover better, which requires a multi-sectoral response. And the objectives of the strategy has been to really try to ensure learning is spread between countries throughout the regions, but also to look at the degree by which health has been integrated in disaster risk reduction strategies to date, and to understand where there are gaps that need to be rectified moving forward, but also to support our key stakeholders throughout the region. And um, ultimately, what we are aiming for is to accelerate political momentum for what we hope to see more systematically implemented, and that is the Bangkok principles for implementation of health aspects of the Sendai framework. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the way that we approach this is that we organized a series of webinars on key issues which allowed learning to take place between countries. And these uh, webinars featured uh, government members as well as UN system, NGOs, and civil society. I won't go through the entire list of them, but clearly what we were aiming for was to hone in on those issues that we felt were most relevant beyond the health aspects of the pandemic. So looking at, for example, the dual challenges of how do you manage climate related disasters at the same time that you're trying to manage a pandemic or how to improve risk communication, which is so critical for risk reduction, as well as, of course, the human rights dimensions, which we've seen throughout the region being challenged because of the measures that have been put in place. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. One of the aspects that we've noted throughout the pandemic is the impact of the crisis uh, on businesses and especially small and medium sized enterprises. Now we know that in any disaster, uh, a business, a small and medium sized business that is not prepared, doesn't have a business continuity plan in place, is likely to be highly uh, impacted by the disaster and may even close down for good. So we did develop some tools to support the business sector to put in place uh, business continuity and recovery planning. This has now been uh, translated into different languages throughout the region. And we're also developing a quick risk estimation tool that will enable businesses to self-assess their risk to COVID-19. We've done a push on this now, but with the understanding that these tools should then translate into business continuity planning and recovery planning for a, a range of disasters, for a multi-hazard approach that businesses in the region need to take. So this is something we'll be following up on post-COVID-19. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Next slide, please, thank you. Please go ahead, thank you. I mentioned before the Bangkok principles, and let me explain for a moment why these are so important. As you are all aware, the Sendai framework uh, doesn't just look at natural hazard. It takes a multi-hazard approach, it promotes a multi-hazard approach. And part of that is really understanding the risk of health emergencies in the region and the need to see better linkages between traditional disaster risk management, which is often focused on natural hazards and new hazards such as biological hazards, which include pandemics. Um, what we have been doing in the region has been looking more intently to see to which degree 
are these integrated? In other words, to which degree do disaster risk reduction strategies really encompass the full range of hazards uh, that could impact a country? So we have undertaken a systematic review of DRR strategies, uh, which I'll talk about in a moment. But we've also worked with Rajiv and his team to develop a technical advisory document to allow two things. One, better integration of biological hazards into the existing and future national, but also local disaster risk reduction strategies, but also to better incorporate uh, health hazards as well as biological hazards more broadly into the UN's own work at the country level, which is known as UN Sustainable Development Cooperation Frameworks. In the process of doing this, we have been looking uh, more intently at what has been the governance mechanisms that have been put in place to manage COVID. And here we are seeing uh, real, I would say, um, silos that have formed and not the integration that one would hope for. So if we can move along quickly with the next slide, please. Some of the, next slide please, some of the initial findings show us that strategies in the region are rarely based on a multi-hazard risk profile. And that although some strategies mention biological hazards, for the most part, you really do not see the provisions needed in a country to manage a biological hazard using a multi-sectoral approach. In other words, beyond the health sector. And we're not seeing, I would say, the full usage of the tools and mechanisms that exist within the disaster risk management uh, world that being brought to bear on um, the response to the biological hazard, in this case, uh, COVID-19. Um, I'd like to move along quickly because I've been told I only have a minute or two left. Uh, so next slide, please. One of the important things that uh, we have been working on now is really trying to promote a green recovery. We feel that recovery is an opportunity to really promote uh, uh, climate sensitive approaches that will not put us backwards, but really take us forward to help deal with the other problem that of course is so prevalent in the Asia Pacific, which is the impact of climate change on risk. And finally, I'd like just to share a few lessons from what we have seen so far in the COVID response. Next slide, please. First of all, um, we really do believe that countries need to adopt a multi-hazard approach to disaster risk reduction, disaster risk planning. We have seen simultaneous and cascading disasters. Uh, Cyclone Herald in the Pacific is an example of this, as well as the cyclones that have hit India and Bangladesh. We need to look at how do you integrate uh, biological hazards and health emergencies into disaster risk management, governments, uh, structures, but also policies and strategies. And we also call for more transparency and information sharing, including transboundary cooperation. We think that this is critical to mounting quick and appropriate responses. And finally, it has uh, shown us that this uh, region needs to really focus on including the informal sector and marginalized groups in planning. Uh, in any disaster, it is the older people, the women and girls that are most likely to be impacted. It is the same thing in COVID. We need to look at the underlying vulnerabilities that lead us to this unfortunate um, uh, conclusion that these groups continue to be marginalized in disasters. And I think COVID has shone a light on the need for greater focus on vulnerability reduction. I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Laurie, for this wonderful presentation at the regional level, but also summarizing uh, some of the key lessons. And as you have pointed out, that uh, the need of this multi-hazard risk profile, uh, uh, risk profile-based strategies, I think that's at the national level, but also need at the local level. I think it's very, very important. And um, now it's actually the time to look at once again what we call the Sendai hazards and uh, how we can actually bring, it's already five years and uh, we have only 10 years left. So I don't know what is coming in future. So it's actually a very high time to look at uh, different types of hazards and to look at in a multi-hazard perspective, the health into, uh, and your point, I fully agree with that, that we have been looking COVID-19 as a health issue, but it's beyond health issue, the socioeconomic impact, ecological impact, because there are so many other different things. So we'll come back to some of the issues a little bit later in the Q&A session. Thank you very much for that. Uh, our next speaker is um, 
Miss Antonia Yulo Loizaga, uh, we call her Tony. Uh, she is from Philippines and she is the president of the National Resilience Council and chairperson of the International Advisory Board of the Manila Observatory. And uh, Tony is um, has been she, she has actually has many different hats, but she very nicely linked the science technology with public private sector partnership. And, uh, and that is what this National Resilience Council is all about. And there, uh, it actually helps at the implementation of the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction, SDG, and also looks at the Paris uh, Climate Agreement. And currently, she serves as the chairperson of this uh, International Advisory Board of the Manila Observatory. She also uh, was a member of the uh, UN uh, DRR STAG at the global level, but also in the Asia Pacific level. So over to you, Tony. Thank you very much, Raji. May we have the first slide, please? Thank you again, Rajiv, and thank you for this kind invitation. What I'd like to do today is basically just go over some of the initial uh, efforts of the private sector and of the, uh, of the local governments in terms of responding to the COVID crisis. Next slide, please. May we have the next slide, please? Thank you. As many of you know, and one more click please, the Philippines is an archipelagic country with three major islands, Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao. So in the, our case, basically, there have not just been one outbreak, but several outbreaks in the different settings that we have in the country. Could we have one more click please? At the moment, we have about 26,000 infected, confirmed infected, and uh, active cases, as you can see, are 18. But we have some recoveries, of course, some deaths, and, uh, and, and some that are, of course, under uh, treatment and, and uh, suspected uh, and therefore isolated. What I've tried to do today is categorize the different efforts under a broad heading of, of COVID-19 response, where it is directly related to relief, such as donations of PPEs, donations of food, and direct financial assistance. What we try to do is, in fact, put that under relief. Uh, under disaster recovery, we have under put measures that have been taken both by the private sector and national and local government to actually begin to resume uh, the economy and, and the road to normalcy, where there have been institutional arrangements and there have been investments in upgrading the health service delivery system augmentation of testing and isolation facilities and adopting digital tools to prevent and prepare for the next hazard. I put those under disaster preparedness and prevention. So you see here a broad category of investments and actions that have taken place both by the private sector and local governments in collaboration with the national government of the Philippines. Next slide, please. As you can see, the Philippine private sector has really stepped up in terms of the gap that was identified very early on of capacity to address uh, the, the impact of the COVID-19 crisis. Specifically, the private sector has stepped in to provide food and cash relief donations for personal need kits for vulnerable communities and frontliners. This was especially needed because Metro Manila was hardest hit this is the most populous region, together with Region 3 and 4A, comprising about 25 million people, many of whom were in formal communities. And at the end of the day, those were the most in need for immediate assistance. So relief in the form of donations for food and personal needs came very early from the private sector in collaboration with both national government and the individual local governments of Metro Manila, Region 3 and 4A. This, this three regions comprise about 37% of annual GDP for the country. 
So this was absolutely critical for them to address the needs immediately in terms of the, the demand for the demand for immediate assistance. Next slide, please. So here you see, in fact, uh, the donations of PPE and augmentation of testing capacities was very quick, again, from the private sector in collaboration with the Disaster uh, Risk Management Council, specifically the Department of Health and the interagency task force that was organized for the COVID crisis. Corporations and conglomerates such as San Miguel Corporation, the Ayala Group, and the SM Group, these are the three largest conglomerates in the country, stepped in to provide augmentation of testing capacities immediately, the upgrading of laboratories as well, the, the building of new isolation facilities and the upgrading of hospitals where in fact COVID patients would then be admitted. Next slide, please. One of the big innovations, and I shall highlight here in the time that we are, uh, we are has made, made, made available, just innovations and, and new practices that have emerged out of this crisis. Big conglomerates that had logistic systems actually provided support to bring agricultural produce to markets. This was especially critical for the cities where in food security became an immediate challenge. So we had companies like San Miguel Corporation, which is a food and energy conglomerate, using their logistic systems and the distribution points in the, the different gasoline stations that they owned to bring farmers' produce from the provinces because transportation was curtailed under the quarantine system to bring the produce to market so that cities could actually avail of the food that was much needed since none of this is actually grown in the urban areas of Metro Manila. Next slide, please. There were also major contributions in terms of conversion of manufacturing facilities. And here specifically, we see a, a very, very popular gin brand uh, company, also under the San Miguel Group, that converted all their facilities. Initially, a, a main facility here, 30 kilometers outside of Metro Manila, but then eventually several, several of, the, of the plants were converted to produce alcohol for sanitizing of hospitals and communities. All their needs were being met, both by the private sector and the public sector, with DOH pitching in for whatever it could. But clearly, the demand for sanitizing and antiseptic equipment and, and supplies was very much in need. So private sector stepped in to immediately convert their facilities to produce alcohol. Next slide, please. Financial relief and safety nets were a very key part of the intervention. And here you see three examples where Philippine corporations provided direct financial assistance, compensation, full compensation, and partial compensation to all their employees despite the lockdown. So we are now a nation which has possibly the longest lockdown period in the world. We are on our third month of community quarantines with different degrees of strictness but we still are not allowed to move freely in the streets. Public transportation has not been restored. Uh, other companies that have provided relief are banks and, and utility companies where in the delays in payments were allowed, charges were not placed on delayed payments, and loans are being restructured by different banks in order for their borrowers to actually um, overcome this crisis. So financial relief and safety nets were a big part of of private sector contributions. Next slide, please. So ensuring safe return to work, this was especially critical in the, on the road to recovery. So both local governments and the private sector, as you see here, have in, in, installed testing capacity, both for rapid antibody testing and RT-PCR. Uh, in order for get, to get the workforce back into their places of work and for the economy to resume. Next slide, please. Maybe have the next slide, please. Thank you. 
So delivering recovery support to the most vulnerable, this was a very big part of the both national and local government relief and response system and the private sector as well. There is about 200 billion pesos of social amelioration funding that was going to be given out to about 18 million uh, vulnerable families. This is ongoing in two phases. And, and private rural banks, as well as microfinance institutions, are being used in order to deliver this, this very, very much needed financial relief. So recovery support in terms of social amelioration and microfinance lending uh, funds have been made available through various microfinance institutions privately and funded and government funded as well. So there was a very big push to actually address the needs of the most vulnerable. I note uh, Loretta's presentation that in fact, informal communities were left basically unserved. And here we see that we are able to address both by government and the private sector those that are known to be vulnerable and those that emerge to be vulnerable because they were not in government statistics, but eventually came to the local government seeking help. Channels like this were made available in order for government funding and private sector lending to actually happen in order for them to receive relief as well as begin the road to recovery. Next slide, please. Among the critical innovations for the Philippines was adopting of digital tools for the pandemic response and recovery. And here you see public-private collaboration together with academe. On the left-hand side, you actually see a project that is ongoing. We're in six, six local government units are, are undergoing training funded by the private sector and, and also administered by universities in order to begin to spatially and temporarily build situational awareness for the way COVID is being transmitted in their communities. On the right-hand side, you see uh, a local government partner of the National Resilience Council has reached out to their local IT private sector companies in order to develop a tracing app. This is in response to a gap because the national government has not been able as yet to come up with a comprehensive tracing app. And therefore, cities are taking this on on their own as part of their initiative to, to, to actually be supported by public and private funding as well. Next slide, please. Could you, could you continue clicking, please? So aside from, aside from these other measures, in terms of trying to build situation, oh, I'm sorry, um, could you click? Uh, one slide back, please. There should be uh, a number of images that will emerge here, but a series of, of evidence-informed action through dialogue webinars were actually organized by the Makati Business Club, which is the premier business club in the country. The Arise Philippines, which is part of UNDRR's effort to organize the private sector in the country. The Zwilling Family Foundation, as well as the National Resilience Council were all were tapped to actually organize these webinars to build dial to build a, a venue for dialogue between the public and private sectors and benchmark ourselves against the global practice. This was very much needed in the beginning because in fact um, there was very little data and, and information available on the way COVID was spreading throughout the population. Next slide please. So we have been asked to, to recommend three measures uh, towards building a future resilient society, and here are my three. We need to understand local risk and vulnerability better. Um, invest in early detection, early warning, prevention, and pre-disaster recovery planning. My second point is to build capacities for crisis management and leadership, and learn from good practices across sectors, particularly learning from the business community, the private sector, in terms of crisis management. Third would be to reorganize ourselves societally to enable collective action against disaster risk, and that's to all hazards. If you click one more, please. This is my last slide. This is an effort that we are, bu we are building now in order to engage the League of Corporate Foundations in the implementation of the international agreements you see above. 
what we'd like to do is in fact engage all sectors, not just in tapping conventional corporate social responsibility funding, but embedding disaster risk reduction, particularly at this point, in terms of health security for future pandemics in the core business value cycles of corporations. And this is an effort that's ongoing and we hope that we'll be able to share this as it evolves with all of you um, in the audience. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tony, for again, a very, very comprehensive summary of all the work which you are doing. We'll come back to some of the questions uh, a little bit later. Uh, our next speaker and the final speaker will be Professor Takako Izumi. Again, many of you know her well. Uh, she is an associate professor in International uh, Research Institute of Disaster Science um, called IRIDES in Tohoku University and also director of APRU's multi-hazard program. And uh, she has been there in Tohoku University since 2013. But uh, before that, she also served in very important positions in uh, United Nations, in uh, non-profit organization or non-government organizations. And currently, uh, she is uh, leading the APRU's multi-hazard program. So she herself is a classic example of this, what we call the multi-sectoral collaboration. <laughs> Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, so over to you, Takako-san. Thank you very much, Professor Sho, for your uh, introduction. Um, today, I'd like to talk about uh, impact of COVID-19, especially on higher educational institutions. So the coronavirus disease has affected various uh, sectors, including higher educational institutions. So, um, however, the question are whether HEIs were well prepared for the disaster. If so, what kind of preparedness measures were taken? If not, how they need to improve the current preparedness capacity? So to answer these questions, we conducted an online survey among HEIs, and I would like to introduce some uh, findings from the survey today. So the survey was conducted in April this year and its main objective was to understand the key challenges being faced by HEIs during the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. So the survey focused on several aspects. We tried to assess uh, first one is organizational preparedness and response. Then second is key challenges at organization level and third is personal response and challenges. So today I'd like to share the result, mainly the first, point, first and second point. And we received overall 150 responses from 65 countries, uh, sorry, 65 universities in 29 countries. But 90, 75% of the responses were from Asia. And therefore I could say that the findings are more for Asia. Um, there is a possibility that they, if we uh, conduct the survey in the, the different region, the uh, finding can be uh, different. To analyze the organization preparedness level, we try to look into the exercise, uh, existence of an emergency management office and the business continuity plans in their AGIs. Also, if they have BCPs, the question was whether the plans cover pandemic or not, and the simulation exercise was conducted based on the BCP in advance. The result shows that 47% uh, of the respondents believe that their institutions lacked a pen, uh, permanent or dedicated emergency management office. And 41% uh, said that their HEIs lacked a general BCP. Even with BCPs, 33% of the plants do not cover biological hazards and pandemic risk management. And 60% 60% of the BCPs did not include conducting simulation exercises. So certainly without conducting a simulation exercise uh, based on the BCPs, the effectiveness of that kind of document will not be measured. So all in all, 50%, nearly 50% of universities or HEIs are not ready, especially for a uh, pandemic. 
And the next question was about the key challenges at organizational level. And we asked uh, the, uh, the respondents to select three key challenges from the options we, we gave them in the uh, questionnaire. And um, the top two, top two key challenges selected were related to a governance issue. And the highest was a lack of adequate preparedness uh, for pandemic. And the second was a lack of pandemic specific advanced simulation exercise. So it is followed a lack of BCPs uh, for pandemic as well. Then the next, uh, the batch and the other challenges pointed out were mainly in relation to the shift in education from traditional classroom learning to online based learning. So in addition, some respondents highlighted the difficulty of accessing the internet. So it's more like a technical uh, issues. So the, then uh, in addition to that, uh, sorry, the finding that I want to highlight here is that the governance issues are more uh, strongly addressed uh, than the educational issue as a, uh, as a key challenges by the, uh, the respondents. So that, uh, the implies, that implies that people in HEIs actually understand and already realize the importance of uh, uh, preparedness and also the, the governance issues like uh, BCPs and also the uh, uh, crisis management, the existence of crisis management office. So based on the, these uh, findings and of the organizational preparedness level and key challenges. So I'd like to highlight key lessons for future organizational preparedness. As I already mentioned a couple of times, the governance is the most important part for HEIs, uh, such as developing BCPs and also emergency management units. And secondly, they in the area of education. So uh, in this time, we, including students and faculty members, uh, uh, had to go through a quite difficult time. Uh, suddenly, we, were, uh, we had to shift the educational and learning mode from face-to-face uh, -to, -face to their online. So that uh, for the future, ideally, uh, we could have educational system like branded uh, learning approaches. Not only, uh, you know, the, not to choose either one, but rather, uh, we combine the uh, educational pattern, I mean, the, uh, the learning systems as, uh, uh, as in, in based on the needs and also the context. And the third one is awareness raising. Uh, awareness raising. It's not only focus on the natural hazards, but rather uh, it's very important to focus on all types of hazards. So uh, awareness raising activities, not only for natural hazards, but rather chemical and biological hazards are quite important on the uh, HEIs as well. Then others and networking with various stakeholders uh, to, uh, to enable HI, HEIs to contribute to the, uh, the building, the uh, resilient community and designated, um, uh, the, uh, designated uh, the funding and an investment by HEIs to scale up the uh, researches and also the uh, capacity building is quite important uh, on campus. So that all these uh, uh, findings, the details of the findings you can uh, see from a paper which was just accepted on the Journal of International Journal of uh, um, uh, International Journal, sorry, the, the, of Disaster Resilience in the Built Environment. So uh, more uh, details can be uh, taken from that uh, the paper. And this is my last slide about an initial lesson from the experience of COVID-19. As already uh, Lori mentioned uh, and emphasized the importance of the multi-hazard approach and um, the how to prepare for different types of disasters, natural, natural and biological and chemical and others. And since the framework for disaster risk reduction uh, emphasized the importance of focusing on different types of disasters in a national strategy. So uh, how to do it is that, and firstly, is need to work with different sectors and experts and for further collaboration at regional and international levels. We have been working on that quite many, quite long time already, uh, focusing on natural hazards, but rather uh, now we have to expand our responsibility to a wider areas so that we need to work much harder than that. 
So uh, for HEIs, those who have not developed the BCPs and important documents yet, I think uh, you can refer to uh, some of the documents from the US because they adopt the old hazard approach in those documents, which is quite important. So uh, I think it is a very good model uh, to develop uh, the BCPs and also the other emergency uh, documents. And the last point is that in old hazard approach, uh, it's quite broadened uh, the topic and area so that I think uh, we have to some, some sort of focus and try to identify the areas in common, like uh, in risk, risk assessment and, and emergency response and uh, information sharing and risk communication. But this is, uh, I think this is still uh, quite uh, a lot of discussions and, and, and debate on how uh, we can combine and incorporate all these different types of disasters in a national planning document. So I really look forward to working uh, with all of you uh, to develop and, 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 and strengthen our preparedness in, in, in country level and also local level, as well as uh, uh, higher education in, in institutions. So thank you so much uh, for your attention. And uh, if you have any questions, please ask at the end of the session. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Takako-san, for again, a very comprehensive presentation on the Higher Education uh, Institute, and especially to show the survey result. So I think um, all of our uh, speakers were very comprehensive and that actually give us some 10, 15 minutes time um, to have some question answer session. So um, uh, I also thank to all the all the people who had put their questions. Um, so let me just pick up a few of them and go one by one. Uh, maybe first I would like to go to Lori. Uh, Lori, uh, there are uh, there are several questions actually, but I would like to point out these three questions if you can respond. Uh, one was that uh, this was actually a broad question that in the UNDRR. Uh, are you thinking of reviewing the Sendai framework to adopt the COVID-19 context? So it is like a broader review, whether it is a global review or the regional review, try to look at that. So that was a broader question. And two specific questions were uh, someone, uh, one colleague from Australia has pointed out that uh, there is this multi-agency and multi-hazard international early warning system where UNDRR is a part, where WHO is there, WMO is there. So this has been possibly very effective for climate related multi-hazard warning system. But how do you think the future possibilities of this type of pandemic induced multi-hazard early warning? So that's the second part. And the third one is that how this multi-hazard approach, which you pointed out, it will help us in preventing the next COVID-19. So if you can respond quickly on that. Okay, I'll try to respond quickly. I mean, first of all, about reviewing the Sendai framework. The Sendai framework already takes into account uh, biological hazards and uh, health hazards. Now, the problem has been that uh, the countries, as we've seen through our review, have really focused on natural hazards, and that's understandable considering the impact of climate change. So what we are going to be doing is a midterm review of the Sendai framework globally, as we are reaching the point of uh, halfway between 2015-2030 uh, to really look at how effective the Sendai framework has been and also, of course, what has been the achievements at the country levels. And I think this will be a, a, an opportunity to reflect globally on whether or not countries are really embracing the multi-hazard nature, and if not, why not? But more specifically towards the region, we are undertaking a review of the Asia Action Plan now, currently, uh, in preparation for the next Asia Action Plan, which is every two years, we're moving to three years. Here we will definitely have an opportunity to put far more emphasis on health emergencies, which I have to admit we have not done in the past. And that's you know, largely because we have been so focused on climate related emergencies because those are the most frequent. And here I would definitely expect to see at the regional level, these strategies really look not only at um, other types of hazards, but the interconnectedness between hazards, such as uh, biological hazards and um, 
climate related hazards, for example. And that takes us to the point about the, the crews and the uh, early warning systems. I think that's a really excellent question. Again, uh, there has been a large focus on climate related hazards and we now need to look at some of the tools and methodologies that we've been using, in particular around risk assessments and really try to adapt them to have more of a multi-hazard approach. So we're looking at the, the range of um, hazards. I think one of the challenges that all of the countries will be facing is how do we, um, how do we understand systemic risks? And certainly COVID-19 for us is a wake-up call around systemic risks. You cannot look at risks in isolation. And here we are going to be moving towards piloting the graph, which is a tool that is being developed. It's still quite theoretical, I think, to some degree. Um, but how can we practically put in place a mechanism, a methodology that would allow countries to understand the interconnected nature of risks and put in place mitigation measures? So that's definitely where the system is going now. We will not be looking at hazards anymore singular, uh, as a singular hazard, but as interconnected and as systemic. Um, and that will be captured in early warning systems and risk assessment tools uh, throughout the broad range of uh, mechanisms that we have on risk reduction. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. So I hope that in the next um, regional plan of action and especially in the next uh, regional uh, ministerial meeting, possibly this issue will come very strongly and very much look forward for that. Thank you. Uh, let me now go to Dr. Kim. Uh, your presentation has actually uh, sparked very interesting lots of questions and I have picked up uh, three or four out of them. Uh, number one uh, is uh, you had a great success story uh, in Korea. So first question is that how Korea could do this massive number of PCR tests daily. So it needs lots of logistic support. So if you can focus on that, that's number one. Number two was that um, you talked about the strong leadership, political leadership. And there were two questions regarding that. One was that how people responded to the government efforts, were there any resistance, were there any disciplinary issue or thing? And then there was another interesting question is that this political leadership, is it very typical of Korea? Or can it be uh, also think about, thought about a policy which can be possibly used by other countries as an example. So that's on the political leadership. And the third one is that what are the main components of the uh, response plan, uh, especially uh, the, the re response manual, uh, which you mentioned. So these are the three major questions if you can answer. Okay, thank you, Raji. Uh, you asked three questions about the first uh, one is uh, how the Korea successfully the implemented these various the rapid the te diagnostic testing, and second one is the political leadership and third one response manual. First, the how the Korea successfully implemented the rapid diagnostic test. The first I'd like to give the answer in the three ways. The first one is innovative technologies. The Korean government approved the rapid diagnostic test kit under the emergency situation. So thanks to the rapid approval system and technology innovation, Korea has the capabilities to for the rapid diagnostic test. Second one is preparedness. And based on the double loop learning from the MERS 2015, after 2015, the Korean government, especially Korea, the CDC sent the preparation disease. So Korea CDC, they equipped the various capabilities beyond the capacities. So in this case, the case uh, Korea CDC the allowed the all the regional the test institutions to take this rapid uh, diagnosis test. And the last one is political leadership because the president and the prime minister gave the pull the responsibility to the head of the KCDC and under this empowerment, the KCDC was able to respond effectively. And the second one you asked about the political leadership about the, uh, sorry, your question is political leadership. Ah, your, your question is about the response manual, right? The response manual, the, the, the Korean Disaster Risk the management system 
comprise the three tier system. The first one is the standard risk management manual. It's a time level manual and it delineates the roles and responsibilities about the response agency and the coordination agency, so all related support agencies. Second one is a working manual. Based on this working manual, all the response agencies should develop their own action plan. The last one is action manual in the, in the field. Based on this action manual, all the local government and even the regional government should check their capabilities just in case of the situations. So the, based on this manual, the roles and the responses the, the, among the response agency, all the responsible agencies clearly delineated. So that's the, the because of the how the Korea successfully responded to this COVID-19. And the political leadership, it's hard to say that there are all other countries can adopt these types of leadership or policies, but however, I believe that the number one is transparency. Uh, the, based on the social trust, because just after the first occurrence of the confirmed cases, Korean government transparently disclosed all the information to the citizen and the daily briefing from the, the head of the response agency and also the KCDC. They clearly explained the current situation and asked the older citizens to have the self-responsibilities. So I believe this the principle of the transparency and democracy can be applied to all other countries. Thanks. Thank you. I think that was a very strong point. Like I think for this type of invisible disaster, I think transparency of information and uh, democratic behavior and the citizen's role becomes very, very important. Thank you for that. Tony, I have um, several questions for you, but I picked two of them, which are very, very interesting. Uh, one was that, um, how do you see this COVID-19 impact uh, when COVID-19 and the typhoon uh, hit uh, Philippines, especially its impact on the micro, small, medium uh, enterprises, what we call the MSME or the, the smaller business sector. That's one. And there was another very specific question that um, in many places, the construction industry has suffered quite strongly. So is there any example from Philippines that what was the strategy adopted in the construction sector, if you are aware about. So if you can focus on these two questions first. Yes, thank you very much, Rajiv. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, on the impact on MSMEs, uh, I think very, very, very early on, this was very high in the consciousness of the government, particularly the Department of Trade and Industry and the large conglomerates who depend on the micro, small and medium industries to actually continue their business. So there was an immediate push to actually help and put in place some kind of relief for small suppliers, for small entrepreneurs, and microfinance institutions were immediately tapped. And um, the tools are constantly being tweaked because in fact the needs are very different. Uh, one large microfinance institution reported that their payments uh, did not falter. Many of their many of their small and micro entrepreneurs continued to actually uh, repay any loans and obligations that they had, uh, largely because there was relief provided by the larger conglomerates and because the government put in place the social amelioration program very early on. So this was a, a big measure that was passed through Congress for the government to distribute amounts directly to informal families and those that were actually classified as vulnerable in order for them to continue with their daily lives. So there was a big push both on the private as well as on the public uh, sector to, to actually address the needs of MSMEs. There is no doubt that some will not be able to weather this crisis. And, and that is, in fact, uh, a reality that we are all beginning to face. Even the larger conglomerates have begun to retrench uh, their employees as of this time. However, there was a deliberate uh, effort to actually address the MSMEs. To your second point, um, we did consult with major construction uh, companies. And what they have done is put in place measures 
to actually address the building methods and the construction methods of each of their sites in order for them to actually uh, if, uh, prevent transmission on site. And some of these measures have been to actually um, hold the workers already uh, working on their sites and co continuously test them, both rapid antibody and PCR tests, as well as um, alter their building methods, especially for the vertical developments, wherein crews will alternate on different floors in order for transmission to actually be prevented. So the construction industry has indeed stepped up uh, Horizontally, uh, that has come to a pause. Uh, we've, we've talked about major construction companies who are building the large buildings at this time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Takako-san, a very quick question. I know that we are a little bit uh, running behind the schedule. So very quick question is like you talked about the online, uh, online classes and all these things, but in many developing countries or even in a developed uh, uh, developing countries, yeah, I will say that uh, where there are not that much of internet, the smaller colleges or the local regional universities, uh, what will be your suggestions for uh, coping with this type of situation, especially in the higher education institute, where we have this digital divide? Thank you, Professor Shaw. I think uh, this kind of experience we have never uh, had before at the uh, HEI's level. So that it's it's very big issue for us and, and challenges. And unfortunately, I don't have a very specific answer because this has never been uh, experienced. So, but uh, now we really uh, realize the importance of the, uh, to have the different methods because we already, we really, uh, focused and uh, relied on the classroom uh, lectures and learning so far. Uh, of course, we, we try to in integrate some of the online, but actually it's not really advanced yet. So this was a very good opportunity for us to uh, combine, to identify a positive side of the combining of the different uh, educational methodology and online and face-to-face. So, but uh, I totally understand some of the countries still have the, a lot of difficulties only to access that kind of internet. So uh, this, again, this will be a very good opportunity for the national and uh, local level. Uh, they have to uh, understand it's very really important to have that kind of technology and uh, for future education. So that uh, I hope this opportunity leads to the more development in the, uh, that kind of uh, infrastructure in developing countries as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, ladies and gentlemen, I still see some of the questions coming up, which possibly can be taken individually by, by our esteemed panelists and speaker. But let me just uh, summarize here that, you know, that we used to say that disaster risk reduction um, is everyone's business. And COVID-19 possibly really taught us, indeed, it is everyone's business. Whether you are a small shopkeeper or you are the owner of a large business, whether you are national or local government, whether you are from school or higher education institute, whether you work for social media or mass media, whether you work for UN agencies, bilateral or multilateral development agencies, each one of us have a very important role to play. And we are possibly in a new world and that's possibly our new normal. Multi-sectoral collaboration is very, very important to overcome um, as well as, as I mentioned in my opening, to live with this COVID-19. Uh, some of you are who are participating from Japan who might be aware about this concept which Japanese government has been promoting called Society 5.0, which is a very human-centric technology-linked society uh, with emerging technologies like AI, IoT, blockchain, etc. at the core of our new lifestyle. We have been seeing this. We all understand that even in the developed countries, there are digital divides. And I saw, saw some of you have asked this particular question, uh, how, how we do a scientific uh, definition of the new normal. We don't have a very specific answer, but one thing possibly coming out, this human-centric and technology-driven society. And there we should not forget this human-centric part. Uh, to me personally, this COVID-19 taught us very important aspects of human as well as nature and where possibly a responsible citizenship becomes a very, very important role. Government fiscal policies have very critical importance, not only just to boost the economy, but also make an eco-economy or what you call the eco-centric economy. And possibly in some of the countries, what we are 
looking at the early recovery, that has been uh, a very strong focus that how and uh, an ecology centric or an environment centric uh, business continuity plan can be formed. And the uh, second point would be this innovation and technology, and that is definitely another key areas. Uh, actually, yesterday we were, uh, KO University was doing uh, what we called an online hackathon uh, on social innovation. And uh, with uh, five different universities in India and Japan. And what we found is these young professionals, researchers, practitioners, this young mind, they have a very, very strong key role to play. I think COVID-19 could, COVID could stop us from doing any, many things, but it could not stop us to make new innovation. So this cross-fertilization, cross-fertilization among different disciplines. Yesterday in our group, it was around 53 students, and we had students from architecture, urban planning, disaster, environment, civil engineering, electrical engineering, chemical engineering, computer science. So like this type of cross-fertilization is extremely important. And where we possibly need lots of mentorship, like especially APRU being uh, an university network, we will be possibly needing more mentorship from different groups in the higher education, whether it is from the government, whether it is from the development agency, whether it is from the industry and also the nonprofit sector, uh, who are also possibly the potential client of this innovation. So I think um, with that, uh, this is uh, possibly the first series of the webinars, APRU, APRU multi-hazard programs will continue. Uh, I once again, thank to all our esteemed uh, panelists and to all our uh, attendees. And I saw in the peak time, it was around 229 uh, attendees uh, from different parts uh, of the world. And it is not only just from this sector, like the Asia Pacific, but also we had people from Mexico. Uh, we had some people, uh, some registered from Chile and some other parts of the, uh, of the Pacific Rim. So thank you very much once again. And uh, with that, I hand over it back to uh, Takako-san for the final comment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Sho, uh, your wonderful moderation. I know that's not a really easy task, and uh, rather it's a very difficult task to, uh, to, to juggle all the questions and also introduce the, uh, the presentations. And once again, thank you so much for your uh, great work. And uh, once again, I would like to thank the excellent speakers today for their participation and contribution. As you all know, I can imagine they are extremely busy for dealing with this coronavirus disease. And I appreciate they spent their valuable time today with us and share their experience and knowledge uh, and with us. And thank you so much. And uh, I hope we can work uh, together for the future and continue this uh, collaboration. And uh, some of the very, very uh, uh, brief inter, uh, information, please be informed that the recording and uh, slides will be shared by email and on the website APLU+.org. And APLU multi hazards program plans to organize another webinar series in July that will be uh, 15th, 22nd, and 29th as the uh, virtual summer school so that all this detail will be uploaded on this uh, website. So please stay tuned with us and, and for further notice and announcements of the APLU multi-hazard program. So I really encourage all of you to join us and uh, uh, try to strengthen our collaboration beyond the sectors and, and our expertise. So lastly, and uh, not but least, I really appreciate the wonderful support from the uh, APLU Secretariat in Hong Kong for their operation of this webinar and promoting this webinar. Uh, without their support, I'm sure this was not really happened. So thank you so much uh, for working uh, behind, the scene, behind the scene. And also that to all the audience uh, who joined today, and thank you so much for your uh, contribution and questions. I'm very sorry we could not uh, answer to all your questions, but uh, 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 I really hope we can uh, send some of the, uh, and answer some of the questions to your email. And lastly, thank you so much once again for your uh, uh, joining us and I hope to see you uh, again in another APLE Multi-Hazard Program event. Thank you so much.